I met Miles Davis when he was playing with Charlie Parker mm. at the... Uh, Three Deuces? No, in Philadelphia at the Downbeat Club. Uh, I knew uh, that's where I met him. I know that it is because that's the week that Charlie Parker was borrowed my saxophone. Oh, <laughs> that's no, a famous yeah. story. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> Miles was in the band, Max Roach, Tommy Potter, and Duke Jordan on the piano. Tommy Potter on bass, Max on drums, as people know. But uh, Miles was the trumpet player with, with Bird at the time. And me uh, having loaned my saxophone to Charlie Parker every night for this week engagement in the club, I was humbled and it was a necessity for me to sit there to hold, plus it was a desire to hear Bird play. And I would take the saxophone to Charlie Parker yeah, and he, he, like? would, and he, he would like? play it. Was well, he, he was a very nice guy. But if well, he, he could play all that music. Oh and yeah. He, and he, and but he was an humble person. I mean, oh, yeah. nice guy to be around. Not like they portrayed him. No, in no, movie. in the movie, that's something mm. different. Mm. Uh, they always like the negatives in the mm. movies in America. Uh, but Charlie Parker says, uh, uh, could I buy A.B.? Mm. Could I buy mm. the saxophone? I said, yeah, man. So I took it up to him, mm. and he'd play, and I'd sit there all night and absorb as much as I could. And Miles was playing the trumpet. And now, of course, I take it every night and take it back home. See, then he knows left in it. Yeah, but but not only that, <laughs> to make sure I had it the next night. Right, right. Make sure you had Charlie it. Parker was no for pawning saxophones. Right. In fact, his might have been in pawn when he was using mine. You see, right. so all week I, I I did that with Charlie Parker, and like you said, Marcus, I would take it out, and I was in the living with my mother and father. In the basement, I take my saxophone out, and he leave his Brill Hart white mouthpiece on there, and my I said, "Oh man, yeah, he had a white Brill Hart mouthpiece on there. his his Charlie Parker's mouthpiece." Oh, and I yeah. take my horn out and play, and my stuff is still still sad as a baby's <laughs> funeral. <laughs> and I thought I, you know, I said, "Man, Bird played all that beautiful stuff through. I know he left some in here." I know he left some notes in here. No, but it wasn't. It would go right through. So I, thought, so I ended up taking it to him all week, and to show you what a nice guy Charlie Parker was, mm -hmm. that uh, I said, um, I had the big band at the time, and I said, "Well, I got to play a benefit for a kid uh, had the, her legs amputated by the streetcar." And so they, uh, Earl Bostic played on this thing, and Earl I had Bostic. my big band. And people love Earl Bostic because he had hits. Mm -hmm. But Charlie yeah. Parker sat in with my, I said, man, would you come and sit in with my band? He said, yeah. Mm. Miles didn't come. Mm. I don't know where Miles was that day, but, but uh, Charlie Parker and Max Roach came and sat in with my big band. Because I had some pretty good people in the band. I had Train. <laughs> Benny Golson <laughs> and Johnny Coles. I had a big band. Of, uh, was really ended up being a feeder band for Dizzy's band because oh, Nelson yeah. Boyd on the bass, and we all went with Dizzy's band. I first met Miles. I forget just what club it was we were playing with the Dizzy Big Band, and uh, Poncho Haygood. He was singing with the group, <laughs> and Miles would come to the club where we were playing on 52nd Street and sit in and be in the trumpet section with Dave Burns, Elman Wright, you know, those. But uh, the thing I think about Miles was that like, he was uh, strange, as they say, in a way. And with me, like, it was kind of strange from the standpoint that I didn't know changes you know, I didn't know the changes in the band. I, I just didn't know, you know. Well, you and know. and rather, yeah, and rather than someone saying, hey, man, I hear you don't know this, which Tom McIntosh did, let me show you what they are, you know. Mm -hmm. Even section right, mm -hmm. help me, but no. But anyway, uh, so that was, and he could be standoffish, and me, I'm the way I am, like, hey, you just went, I can go this way too. So I did. So now in France, 
uh, when they came over, they had a festival in Paris, and there was Charles Deloney, who had the jazz club, Hugh Panasse, who had the uh, Dixieland club, and they were partners, but they didn't like the same kind of music. Like uh, Hugh Panasse, like Sidney Bechet, Charles Deloney, <laughs> like Charlie Parker. Oh, so they had a festival, and in this festival, it wound up being a contest. They had a contest, and the contest was <coughs> who won the festival. Mm -hmm. And being in France, Sidney Bechet won the festival, mm -hmm. which I didn't, you know, I didn't agree with. But Charlie yeah. Parker was there, Miles, uh, Tad Damron, and Kluke was living there then, Kenny mm -hmm. Clark. Mm -hmm. Kenny Durham, so, too. It, Kenny Durham lived in New York? No, he was there. I see, he was there. He was yeah. there, he was there, and so was Mac. But mm -hmm. they weren't living there then. Mm -hmm. they, they, they probably came after. Mm -hmm. But Don Byers, Coleman Hawkins, <laughs> Don B.I.S., Turbo, wasn't he? That, I mean, uh, uh, they were living there. Now, so, like, uh, you know, and Miles, like, he, he was dap, as you say. He was always dap, mm -hmm. at dap, and... Scars, and, yes. at, yeah. Scars. and and the chicks would, and he was a nice looking guy because his speeches were like, you know, so the chicks, mm -hmm. they would go He's crazy over him. Yeah. Yeah. Now, <laughs> now, Nubian. Sexton was talking about he had a Dodge or something, but <laughs> check this out. In his, in his contract later on, would love it, how love it and all that, he had, he wanted a Lam Lamborghini, Lamborghini. And a, a different colored one every day. First time I met him was uh, the, uh, spring of 1957. Uh, at the time, there was this jazz package show called Jazz for Moderns, and the show had uh, Maynard Ferguson's big band. It had Wayne Shorter playing in it, and uh, Dave Brubeck's quartet, uh, Lambert Hendricks and Ross, and uh, Miles's band. And after the show, they were coming back from New York, Rochester coming to New York, and they missed a ride going to the train station. So I had a car, so I took Miles, and. Paul and Philly to the train station to get a train coming to New York. Uh, at the time, Miles just said, hello, and can we get a ride going to the train station? Because my father and Paul's father were on the same bus driving line in Detroit, so I did know him some kind of way. And I said, sure, so we got into the car and drove on to, drove on to the train station downtown Rochester. Uh, I didn't see him again to speak to him until uh, spring of 1963 uh, when he came into the half note. I was working with the quartet of Jim Hall and Art Farmer and uh, Walter Perkins. Mm -hmm. And he kind of snuck around and looked real mysterious with his cape on. And after the first set, he called me over and, and said that he was putting the band together. Paul had finally left to join Wenton and Jimmy Cobb to be a trio for West Montgomery. And he was going to California that week to put a, to finish out the tour, but Jimmy had, had, had agreed to finish the tour that he started. So I said, I'm available, but I'm working with Art Farmer for this week. So what you have to do, you have to ask Art Farmer if, if it's okay if I leave this job, you know? So after the next set, he, Art Farmer talked and uh, Art Farmer agreed that I could leave the band midweek and leave the next day to go with Miles out to California. The first gig was uh, at the Blackhawk. That's how I met him.